So it's always a privilege and uh, a joy to, to come and worship God with you and to bring the Word of God uh, to you. And so I'm just delighted for that privilege that's been extended to me over this period of time. Uh, I've really loved it and uh, been blessed by it. All right, so I reckon it's great when we pray to just get revelation from God and not just, here's another sermon, you know, we've heard so many sermons, uh, but always to have that edge of expectancy, God's going to speak to me, that this is a divine appointment, that you're meant to be here to hear what's about to be spoken over you. Who's with that? Who's not with that? Who wouldn't lift your hand no matter what I said? All right, there's, yeah, there's a few, there's always a few. But you did just lift your hand. All right, so let's pray. Lord, the life and liberty and release of your spirit in this place. I thank you for more than just another message, but a word from you in season. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So the title I've given to this message is Get a Life. Get a life. And, you know, you've been waiting to say that to the person sitting next to you, so just go right ahead under the, the guise of this sermon title. Just tell them to get a life. Yep. So this is uh, one of my, I would say, a developing life message. You know, after a while, uh, you've been preaching this, just certain topics and themes that really gel with the journey of your life, and this tonight is is one of them. And it came out of quite of a dark season in my life when I was uh, struggling with depression, actually. I was uh, pastoring a church in uh, country Victoria, Kyabram, near Shepparton. Uh, we'd been there for quite a few years. The church was going really well, but I was not going well. I, I was suffering with really the bad stress headaches and uh, palpitations of the heart and as I said, just feeling, just battling this gloom that would seem to be on my life. And uh, just no real explanation for it because it wasn't triggered by an incident. It was just how I was feeling. And uh, so I decided it's time for a holiday. I took my family with me away uh, to the Grampian Mountains, which is a beautiful area. I get up early one morning. I'm going down to the, the local shops to buy milk and bread and so I'm standing in the uh, the cafe the shop to buy this and um, it was a it was a setup God God was about to do something that I had not uh, you know who would have thought you can have a God encounter in in a cafe while you're oh some of you probably think after the third cup of coffee it's possible uh, but you know, I'm there. I wasn't expecting this, but I've learned that one of the names of God is Jehovah Sneaky, <laughs> all right? And because uh, he's just sneaky. He just sneaks up on you. So I'm standing up uh, in the, and I'm in the queue waiting to be served and off to the side is this poster. Uh, either the owner of the shop or someone had put up this poster, which was uh, a scripture from the, the message and it's the words of Jesus, Matthew 11, 28. So here I am, pretty well burned out, feeling pretty, pretty messed up and down. And lo and behold, this is what I'm reading. Are you tired, worn out, burnt out in religion? Come to me, get away with me, and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me and watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. That's beautiful. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. So how ironic. What a comparison of, of what Jesus was inviting me into, the lifestyle that he was calling Christianity and what I can expect by following him, and yet what I was standing in. It was such a stark contrast. And uh, I thought, what? This is, I've, I've obviously gotten lost along the way. Uh, here I am. Uh, I'm meant to be living that. And I'm so not. What's going on? And so I left the, the cafe determined to, to rediscover my Christian faith, to work out where did I go wrong? I must have turned left when I should have turned right. 
I should have arrived at, at that, what Jesus was describing, and yet I was polar opposites to that. And I started to realize that I'd complicated Christianity far beyond Jesus' intention. He simplified Christianity down to one a simple statement that we're just going to spend a bit of time unpacking. A simple phrase, simple metaphor, and yet he reached into the realm of nature and decided that's the metaphor I want to use to describe how our relationship, Jesus and you, is meant to work. And here it is. It's in John 15, verses 5 to 6, and he says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. Now, Jesus said, I am the vine. He's not a vine, is he? You know, you're not going to go to heaven and see a vine up there, you know. So he's obviously not meant, he's not meaning you to take him literally. He's saying, I'm going to use this as an illustration. So we should become, okay, what is it about this vine branch relationship, Jesus, that you are wanting us to understand of how you set Christianity up to work? And that's what we're, we're going to unpack together. So really what he's saying is get a life, my life. Just like the branch relies on the on the life of the vine to stay alive. So you need to get my life in you. And friends, tonight, that is the simple truth of it. That we are met, Christianity is not knowledge we learn. You don't become a Christian by being educated in Christian ways. You become a Christian by receiving a life, his life. It's a, it's a mystical union. Christianity is based on a mystical union. You don't need to understand how it works. You just need to know that it does work. That when you open yourself to Jesus Christ, a, a, a life comes into you that empowers you to live a life that you've never actually lived yourself. You get the benefit of a life you've never lived so he's saying, come on, get my life. And he says, listen, if you don't do this, you will not only find Christianity difficult, you'll find it impossible. You just simply, why aren't we listening to him? <laughs> he's just saying, listen, without me, you can't do this. And that's the whole point. The only person that ever lived a, a perfect Christian life is Jesus. And that's why we've got to get his life uh, into us. So that's the, the, the basis of Christianity is actually a mystical union between us and Christ. It's an experience of the life of God in you. When we get together like this and we worship something more than just songs and, and nice words is meant to be happening. There's meant to be a divine exchange going on. There's meant to be a sense of being lifed by Jesus going on in this place. All right, we need to understand that. So let's unpack this metaphor <clears throat> and, and just glean what we can about what is it about this vine branch interrelated uh, relationship that we're meant to get. Well, first of all, the, a branch gives expression to the life of the vine it's attached to. Right, And so we, as branches, Jesus is saying, you are giving expression to my life. You're giving expression to who I am. We don't say glory to the branch, we say glory to the vine because we understand that it's only through its connection to the vine that this branch is able uh, to bear fruit. But on the flip side, there's a mutual benefit going on here between the vine and the branch. Not only is the branch drawing its life from the vine, but the sole means of expression, da -na -na -na. yeah, the sole means of expression for the vine is a branch. It has no other way of expressing itself. And so God gains entry into the world through the willing openness of his branches to express 
uh, his life through us. God, through you, Christian, tonight is gaining entry into the world. That's why you're called the body of Christ. So we have this mutual benefit, us drawing on the life and us being the sole means of expression that God is gaining entry into the world. Sure, we like to talk about angels doing this and that, but that's, that's not God's preferred way. God's preferred way to bring expression into the world is actually through us. And then we notice that the branch doesn't feel pressure in itself to be fruitful because it knows that it's the vine's responsibility to bring to it everything it needs to be fruitful. Vine, you want me to be fruitful? Then you've got to bring to me everything I need to be fruitful. So guess what? Some of you sitting here with a dream, a sense of destiny about what Jesus wants you to do with your life, don't sweat it because it's the vine's responsibility to bring to you all the people you need to meet, all the doors that need to open, all the resource, finance, everything. You need to put your faith on the fact that Jesus is going to bring all those things to me. Not stress and uh, get yourself all twisted into a, a tight little dot about it, but realize, okay, I really feel this is God's will for my life. And this, Well, guess what? It's the vine's responsibility to bring to the branch everything it needs to be fruitful. And guess what? Everything the vine has, it brings to the branch. I mean everything. I mean, you don't get a vine going... Hmm, I'll give you 20%, I'll give you 60%. No, you cut the vine and examine the sap in the vine and you cut the branch and they're identical. Everything the vine has, it's pouring into the branches. Why is that so important for us? Because what's in the life of Jesus is victory and overcoming. This, we're talking about a life, we're told in Hebrews that was tempted in every way, yet without sin. So in this life is the victory you need for that habit you're struggling with. Because the Bible said Jesus Christ himself was tempted in every way. Every means every. That includes whatever you're struggling with. So, and the vine doesn't withhold anything from you intrinsically in this life is the victory, the key to your situation. Jesus said, fear not. You're in the world, but fear not. I have overcome the world. Why is that meant to be comforting to us? Because that overcoming life flows into you. That's what we need to understand. Everything that's, and that's why Paul, the apostle, takes up what could be at times a frustrating solution, one size fits all to whatever. You, you, you raise marriage, he talks about being in Christ. You raise uh, your struggle with finances, with anything in life, and his solution was in Christ, in Christ. Paul, come on. Why is he saying that? Because in Christ, in this life, giving sap of the vine is this overcoming power to everything life is going to throw at you. That's why. He doesn't say you can do all things. He says you can do all things in Christ. What is he doing? He's pointing to the vine saying, see that? In that life-giving uh, spirit of Jesus, you have the victory for everything that you're going through. Now, Jesus knew we'd forget this. He knew we'd forget it, we'd drift, we'd get caught up with life, just like this sermon, possibly forgotten before you get out of the car park, you know. We, we got to live with that. I get it. We get busy, we get distracted, we get stuff going on. So he said, you know what I'm going to do? This is so important. I'm going to anchor it in your life to keep bringing you back to this vine branch, my life in you, critical spiritual union. And so what I'm going to do is create a thing we're going to call communion. 
It's in the church, it's called a sacrament, which is basically a sacred mystery. So when you're having communion, it's not a smoke break in the middle of the church. You know, it's not like, oh, you know, I was feeling a bit peckish. Can I have two? You know, it's not like that, all right? In fact, Paul warns us, if you have that attitude towards it, you're missing out on the benefit of it. You're not attributing full worth to it. So what's really going on here is a couple of things that slip by us, and fair enough, because we're not, we're not Gentiles, and there's a little bit of us understanding the context of Jewish thought here. When a Jew was remembering something, it wasn't like reminiscing. It wasn't like just going back and, oh, wasn't that wonderful? No, it was reliving it. When, it, when Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me, he, he wasn't this nostalgic Christ going, don't you ever forget. Look at these nail prints in my head. You did that to me. <laughs> he wasn't doing that. He was going, I want you to relive it, my life in you, again and again and again and again. And when he said, to, which sounds gross to our ears, and we're going, what is wrong with you, Jesus? When he said in John 6, if you don't eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you don't have the source of life in you. Well, gross. Grace is, what are you on about? What's going on here, Jesus? Well, he's talking about what they would have understood as a spiritual mystery. Because when a Jew hears the word blood, they don't think of death, they think of life. Leviticus says the, the life is in the blood. So when they said, when they're hearing Jesus say, come on, get this into you, he's saying, get my life, get in a life. When you have communion, uh, you know, Tanya's saying to you, hears my voice. Next time you have a communion, hear my voice saying, get alive. <laughs> get alive. Would you just get alive? Well, that's what Jesus is saying. Get alive. Get my life. Drink my blood. He's saying, get my life. Because in this life is everything for life and godliness. All right? And so this is what we need to understand what was going on here. So by faith, we are appropriating, we are reliving that. It's not happening in that moment. We've just forgotten it. And when we remember it, it just quickens it again, that reality, all right? We're accessing it through our awareness, all right? And so this is why the Apostle Paul said, now listen, be careful when you're having communion because if you don't attribute full worth to what you're doing, then you're missing out on its benefits. That's really what he was saying in 1 Corinthians 11. So a really dumb thing happened along the way where we misread that to mean that if you messed up this week, you, you fell, you sinned, you, you had a tough week, you, you know, you kicked the cat, you did the stuff and... You know, and now you're sitting here, boy, I'm bad. I'm, I call myself a Christian. And that you are not worthy to partake of this because you are bad. That is such a nonsense because Jesus meant the, the exact reverse to it. You are the very people that are meant to be getting a life. You had a rough week. Come and get a life. That's exactly what Jesus is actually affirming to us. He's calling out to those of us who are struggling. Come on, you've had, you might be weak, but I'm strong. You might have no peace. Well, here's my peace. You might have no joy. Well, here's my joy. That's the whole thing that Jesus was emphasizing. I'm feeling overwhelmed with life. Well, that's okay because my life has overcome the world. I have overcome the world. You're feeling useless. You're feeling like a nobody. Jesus said, I'm so glad because I love taking nobodies, earthen vessels, so that the excellency of the power may be clearly seen to be of me and not of you. So you feel like a nobody? Oh, great. I'm going to fill you with my life so that people are going to go, wow, the glory of God. This is... This is why we don't interview people before we think 
wonder whether they're good enough Christians. They're going to be a good Christian. Where'd you go to school? How much you got in your bank account? <sighs> you educated? Did you go to uni? Oh, I don't think you're going to be a good Christian. Well, we don't talk like that. Why? Because the weakest person in this room can live the most spiritual life. It's not about you. It's about him. It's about getting his life into you. That's all we need to know. This is, this is Christianity 101. And so Jesus goes on and says, I'm the vine, you're the branches, and without me you can do nothing. Well, why are we more challenged by that? Jesus just told us without him we can do nothing. It's because without him we're doing heaps. But don't tell him. It's like, keep it down. We're doing lots of stuff without him. You know, and so what does he mean? We do lots of stuff without him. And then we sort of pray the prayer at the end. Oh, amen. Yes, blessed it. But we are doing it without him. Well, what he means is, yeah, you can do stuff without me, but you can't get this without me. You want this? You need me. Because as soon as I hold that up, you know that somewhere there's a life source for this to come into existence. There's no way this could be here without a life source. So Jesus said, you want fruit? Well, then you need me for that. You want stuff? Well, you can do that. But here's the thing about stuff, Christian church stuff. It's like getting your feet washed with your socks on. It's like happening, but it's not quite happening. So you sort of keep washing, but I'm not feeling it yet. It's just like this weird thing. It's stuff. You know, we're singing, but it's not worship because it's just Christian entertainment. It's just stuff we're doing. It's not, it's not relation. It's not fruit. See, here's the cool thing about fruit. Here's how you know this is fruit. When, you, when you're sitting under it, when you're partaking, oh, it's lifing you now. When you eat of this, it's lifing you. It comes from life and it gives life. Well, stuff doesn't do that. So he said, listen, you want that? You can't get it without me. You must come to me to get that life. And then he goes on to explain that if you take anything away from its life source, you'll kill it for sure. So when you separate a branch from a vine... It's going to die. You separated it from its life source. But guess what? Da -na -na -na. When you separate a truth from the truth, you'll kill it. So you take a truth of prayer and separate it from the truth, Jesus Christ, relational connection, you just got yourself a dead prayer life. Yes, you're praying, but it's dead. You, if you take worship and separate it from its relational connection with Jesus Christ, you just killed that, and the best you can hope for is some goosebumpy things because of the chords they're playing, you know, and it's like the, you know, chord progression. Oh, yes, I love that. It's just, oh, it's not Jesus. It's just like, you know, you can get that in a lot of concerts, you know. It's just, but it's not, oh, I feel the presence of, you know. You're not, it's like, Feet washed with socks on again, right? I'm not. Uh, it's not this stuff. We feel lifed when we sit under something that's genuinely uh, fruit. So it's so important that we keep our truth connected to that truth. Evangelism just becomes crass and rude and abrupt and abrasive. It's our truth. But when you separate it from its relation, so it's happening, but you think, it just doesn't feel right. Well, then why? Well, it's because it's a truth separated from the truth. That's right. All right, and so we have to keep those two. And so this is why it's just cruel religion to be introducing people to Christianity, pushing fruit, the, the, the need for them to be fruitful without first introducing them to a relational connection to the vine from which the fruit naturally comes. 
When was the last time you walked in your garden, heard the groans of the cabbages and the lettuce and the, you know, the lemon tree? <laughs> Excuse me, I've got a really loud lemon tree. It's, it's bearing fruit at the moment. No, it's very quiet because something natural is happening. Something very natural, something very beautiful, something through mystical union is happening. All right? So it's just cruel to be pushing the fruit aspect without first establishing the vine connection aspect. And, and perhaps one of the greatest imbalances in church today is our continual emphasis on what we must do for God without first emphasizing what's been done. Doing comes out of done. Doing comes out of dunning. <laughs> there you go. All right. So sadly, many sincere believers have read John 15, this whole vine, and they've placed the emphasis where Jesus didn't put it. So they end up with it all being about his demand and threat. If you don't be fruitful, I am going to reject you. All right. That is not what He's saying the emphasis is completely different. It's on relational connection, all right? But when we get the emphasis in the wrong place, we're hearing Jesus say something he didn't say, which is, if you want to be close to me, you need to be fruitful. And so we end up with this uh, thinking that if I can just do enough prayer, do do enough prayer, do do enough Bible study, do do enough good works and church attendance and nice things and I can get all my doo-doo together and stand on top of my doo-doo. Then I can say, God, look at all this doo-doo I've done. Surely I am acceptable in your sight. And as you're standing there, you're hearing a great flush. Because as far as God is concerned, anything you're trying to add to the finished work of Jesus is called self-righteousness. So the next time you're trapped in climbing Mount Doo-Doo, hear a toilet flushing. Because that's what God's doing. And we're talking an aeroplane toilet, right? You know, one of those, those I love those aeroplane toilets. It's like... Be gone in Jesus. Yes, it's gone. Forever gone. I don't know where it's gone. I don't really want to know where it's gone. But somewhere in this plane, it has gone. And so next time you look at all my dude here. Because as far as God's concerned, no amount of prayer, Bible study, or obedience can make you any more acceptable to God than you are right now through the finished work of Jesus Christ. Last time I had checked, finished means finished. And so what are you doing trying to add to it? So you can't add, add to it, all right? So understanding this is really important. According to Jesus, the Christian faith is not working for anything it's working from. It's working from what Jesus has done. We're not using our faith to get things from God. Give me this. I'm using my faith to get things from No. Your faith is like your eye. It doesn't generate light. It receives it. It opens and it's built to see what is already there. So use your faith to see what's already been done and you respond to that. So any decent Bible teacher knows that they're not teaching you to get anything from God. They're teaching you so that you'll see what you have from God. All right? And this is why it says in Colossians 2.10, in Christ you've been brought to fullness. Second Peter says his divine power has already given you uh, everything you need for life and godliness and so this is why Jesus emphasized this importance because it's so foundationary. This is why in another translation of the same passage, we hear Jesus saying, remain in me and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot bear fruit 
If it is severed from the vine, you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Isn't it amazing how we've complicated that? See, if I said to you, remain in this room, and you go, whoo, 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 that's tough. That's, that's really hard. Immediately you go to some sort of effort. What thoughts do you need to think to remain in this room? What emotions do you need to feel in this room? You know, well, what is it that you need? What activity do you need to do to remain in this room? Nothing. Nothing. Why? Because you are already in the room. You are already in the room. That's what Jesus is saying. Just don't go anywhere. All right? That's all he's saying. But we made that so complicated. We went to Mount Dudu. We built up our doo-doo when he said, remain, surely there's got to be some doo-doo. We've got to get around that, all right? But that's not what he meant. Now, is it possible for you to be in this room but incredibly distracted so that you're not drawing any benefit from being in this room? The comfy seat, the air conditioning, uh, you know, all the other trimmings that might go with being in this room. But you're not enjoying any of the benefit because you're so distracted, anxious, uh, you know, stuff going on. What did they mean? They said something out in the foyer. But what did they mean when they said that? Because we have a and I don't want to. You're not hearing a word I'm saying the whole sermon. You're, yeah, well, I t- I'm going back out there and I'm going to tell them what I really think. And you're not hearing this sermon at all. All right. So is it possible for you to be in this room incredibly distracted? Yes. But guess what? That might be your experience of being in the room. But the truth is you are in the room. You are in the room. So all that's really changed. Nothing's really changing. You're just changing your own experience through your awareness. So here's the truth. Stop striving to be where you already are and just intentionally open yourself up to the life of the vine that you're already attached to. going to ask the singers and musicians to come back and help me. Here's a great verse. Colossians 3 says, Don't shuffle along, eyes to the ground, absorb with the things right in front of you, look up. And be alert to what's going on around Christ. That's where the action is. You see, the enemy can't sever you, but he can distract you. And he can work really hard to get your eyes off Jesus Christ. So if I wanted to get your attention, what would be the best way to do it? To throw a leaf at you or a brick? I think a brick would do it. So here come these thoughts of crisis and drama and worst case scenarios and everything to get your eyes off Christ and onto the wind and the waves where you start to sink. Yeah. Nothing's really changed. Jesus hasn't gone anywhere. It's just you got your you got into orphan mode again. You went into orphan abandoned doing life without God mode, doing life without a shepherd mode. I am so tired of saying the Lord is my shepherd and then living like I don't have one. I'm done with it. I'm not doing that anymore. He's my shepherd. I'm gonna live. I'm not gonna I'm not going to, you know, the, the Bible says the enemy gets around like a roaring lion seeking him. Well, what lion in its right mind would roar? I thought they were sneaking. Well, I'll tell you when they start roaring, when they realize there's no chance of getting at that herd unless one of them panics and leaves the protection of the shepherd. That's, that, flock is shepherd, that flock is protected, so I'm going to roar in the hope that one of them is going to freak out and panic and leave the shepherd, and that's when I'll get him. He's prowling around like a roaring lion, roaring intimidation, roaring with case scenarios, any way possible to get your eyes off Jesus.